today I have a, a very amazing woman um, I met a couple of years ago um, in one of the churches that I used to attend before I ported to my current church, Elevation. <laughs> so um, Auntie Akoma, as I like to call her, is Auntie Akoma, as I like to call her, is an amazing woman. She, um, I knew her as the women president, you know, for RCCG Hepsiba in Cheviview at the time when I was attending the church there. And, you know, during the course of, you know, my being there and fellowshipping there, I used to interact with her, but I never saw a baby with her for a long time. And then after a couple of months, um, I noticed that she wasn't, you know, around for a while and then i saw her with a baby in church one sunday and it was dedication day i was so excited i didn't really know her story at that time i still do not know the story and that's why she's here today it's not going to be a regular kind of interview session because this is you know um a conversation that I know needs to be held um, had and I I want her to truly share her authentic story on this journey. So allow me today to introduce to you Mrs. Akoma Udo Udom. Wow, Ichechi, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Ma, for wow. joining us today. Yeah, it's, it's my pleasure. Thank you. It's I my really pleasure. appreciate your presence wow. here. Oh, thank um, you. So um like I said to you, it's not like an interview question and answer session. I want you to, you know, take us through your journey, your experience. You said you were married for twelve years and a half yeah. before you eventually had your baby girl. Yeah. You know, and now you're a mom of two. Yeah. I know that, that those twelve and a half years um must have been really trying, especially um, because of the society where we live in. There's so much um, judgment and you know stigmatization with late conception and you know um, childbirth. And so, how how were you able to you know deal with all this? What what is the real story? Why why did it take so long? And then how were you able to deal with all this? Were they was there trauma, you know, during that 12 years of waiting? How did you receive the, the, the news of conception eventually? Mm -hmm. And were you one of those traditional Nigerian women who, when they find out that um, they, they are pregnant eventually, they conceal, they hide, you know, so to speak, because of the, you know, popular beliefs and myth that, you know, like um, village people, you know, are probably the ones that were after you. <laughs> and so they hide it until, you know, the baby is eventually born. So how did you deal with all that? And um, after the first, was it easy to, you know, conceive the second? You know, just tell us the story, the authentic story, your authentic story, because um, this is basically to speak to the women who are you know currently going through similar situation and telling them that they are not alone you have been there and you're out of it by god's grace and power and these are the things that you experienced these were the ways you you um handled them and today you're victorious um, and then also i wanted to add before i forget you know during those trying times you know they say women usually experience a lot of um frustration anger um anxiety low self-esteem powerlessness do those things eventually go away when the child comes how do you manage you know those situations how does it affect you as an individual you know so many questions yet not so many questions you are going to share your experience uh, you know with us thank okay you. Ichechi, thank you very much honestly it's my great pleasure to you know talk about my experience in those 12 years before the baby finally came but um <clears throat> there's something i always tell people i think my own experience is kind of peculiar to me and mm -hmm. i believe everybody's experience is peculiar to them yes um, so I'm here today to encourage someone out there. Delay is not denial. Mm. Okay, you want to hear the whole story? I got married sometime November 1999. It was an awesome day. And um, 
I got I missed my period exactly four weeks after the wedding. Wow. But something happened. Three months later, pregnancy came down. Hmm. And I thought it was a joke, you know. We didn't have all that money that time. I think by that time I had lost my job. I was working in an oil servicing company. My husband was also working there. I resigned my job actually six months into marriage. And two months later, my husband lost his job. So oh, wow. when the pregnancy came down, we thought, ah, maybe we should wait another one year, get something doing before. Anyway, by the time we got to the second year, I thought the pregnancy would just come like, it came the first time. It was the end of the second year. I suddenly realized that, wow, this thing is not going to come just like that. One year came, two years, three years. OK, along the line, I had one or two other miscarriages before the baby finally came. But I suddenly realized it wasn't a joke. Now, what did I do? I took some decisions when the delay continued, when the years started running, rolling by. I took some personal decisions, which to some people, um, I don't know. Because then I remember a couple of my friends who say, Akoma, you're never under pressure. You act like you don't need a child. They said, in fact, you don't need a child. Why? Because they never saw me weeping. They never saw me depressed. They never saw me sad. And why did that happen? I will tell you, I was hardly sad. Not because I loved the situation, no. But um, as a child of God, I will talk from a child of God's um, perspective, perspective, a believer's perspective. That's why one of my pastors says something. She says, know God for yourself. Yeah. When you know God for yourself, people can't put you down. As at that time, I already knew God for myself. I knew that I was a little God and that nobody can bring me down. I knew that I was a little God and nobody can despise me. I had understood God in such a way that I knew that God is able to do these things. So I took some decisions that helped me. One of the decisions I took was that I told myself, if God doesn't do it, I'm not going to abandon Christianity. I'm not going to abandon my salvation. I will still trust God. That was the first basic decision I took. And I think it was a crucial one. So I took that decision, but I, did, I didn't just sit back. I worked at getting pregnant. I prayed all manners of prayers. Hmm. I did deliverance. I went to Mountain of Fire for a weekend program, a couple of us. You know, you drive fast. In fact, that was the first time I did three days dry fasting, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We pray, 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 and all those kind of things. I remember one of my friends who was also waiting, who in that prayer that weekend, when the anointing came, you know the way it happens in mm, church. Mm. They just prophesied someone was going to have twins, and she just, that anointing carried her, and she fell, and she claimed it. And eventually she had twins, a boy and a girl. Wow. Yes, some years after. So these things actually, she's also a believer. So I prayed all manner of prayers. I fasted. I went to hospitals. I didn't put laws in my hand, into my hands. I went to clinics upon clinics upon clinics. I was living in Port Harcourt then, so I would say I went to one of the best. Oh, really? Yes. You were living in Port Harcourt? Yes, I was. Mm. So I would say I went to one of the best hospitals then. Um, when it comes to prayers, because I knew my God, I didn't run from pastor to pastor. I didn't do it. I didn't run from church to church. Mm. I didn't do it. I think that deliverance went to Mountain of Fire to pray, because I was already reading, using maybe some of their prayer books to pray was the only time I went to a church for a program, you know. So I trusted God. We prayed in church. We fasted, my husband and I, and all that. Like I said, I didn't run from pastor to pastor because I knew my God. You know, it's when people run from pastor to pastor that they get from into trouble. To post. Yes. I will share something. Then where I lived in Port Harcourt, you know the way Port Harcourt houses used to be, newly married people, they used to be flat, you know, we were like four flats in the compound. Mm. And two of us, we were believing God for the fruit of the womb. Mm. So one day my landlady of blessed memory called us. She said, you young girls, they married into this compound. Look, oh, I need to take you to this place. They do massage. I don't know why. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? She said, you, Auntie Akoma, that's how we used to call each other. I know you won't want to go. And I'm like, I'll ask my husband. My husband grew up in Portaco. When I asked him, he said, ah. he knows people. It's as if it's their tradition. He doesn't, know, he doesn't think there's anything wrong. Anyway. We were considering going with mommy, the way we, call, we used to call uh -huh. her. And that Sunday, we had an invited guest in church, a couple, a pharmacist, who came to share her testimony of waiting for the fruit of the womb, either for 12 years or something. And as she was sharing from the altar, she said, I'm from Bielsa. Please don't go to those small, small places where they do massaging. I can tell you they're serving small, small gods. 
She kept emphasizing it from the altar, and as she said it, my landlady turned, and she looked at me in church. The other lady turned, looked at me, and that was it. That was how we didn't go for that massaging. <laughs> so maybe that would have been the only time I would have gone to somewhere that is not a proper mm. hospital, but you know, that was it. They, I think the Lord just sent that person because yeah. of me, and that was it. Another decision I took was that <laughs> I wasn't going to let anybody tamper with my self-esteem. Yes. I've seen in life the things... Did, did, did it begin to happen before no. you decided? No, because, you know, because I had gotten pregnant when I got married, you know, I kept, for the first few years, I was hopeful. I just kept thinking it was going to come, it was going to come, it was going to come. So I would say it took me time to... So by the time I realized this thing wasn't coming, I had begun to take some decisions. Do you get so I told myself nobody was going to bring me down. It was a decision I took. In fact, my body language, when I show up, by the time you see me, you, you can't even bring me down. Do you get know what I'm trying to say? When you see me, I'm always excited. You can't even bring me down. Do you get know what I'm trying to say? I, anywhere I go to, I said the But pace. you know, in our society now, yeah. that will be misconstrued. Why? How? Because people would, yes, you're trying to make yeah. sure that you're happy at whatever, yeah, yeah. you know, situation that you find yourself yeah. in. But people would think that you are just unbothered, especially, um, Some of you my know, friends. your family and in-laws. They will begin to think, oh, this one is not bothered. Our son needs a child. And she's happy and jumping around. Yeah, some people told me that to my face. They said, come on, you're not bothered. You don't need a child. And I'm like, which African woman is married and doesn't need a child? People want to see you look sad. People want to see you wallow in self-pity. I'll give it to my husband, he's a good man. Mm. You know, that's the way I describe him, a good man. He's always been a good man. The family was very supportive. Nobody ever said anything bad to me in those oh, 12 wow. years. Okay. Fantastic in-laws, I must say that to you. Oh, wow. Really, really fantastic. Wow. So I think that support I got was amazing. Mm. It was amazing, but I will tell you something. I've seen a lot of women who their husbands are not worrying them. In-laws are not worrying them. They are the ones worrying themselves. In fact, most of the women are the ones worrying themselves. Women who in such situations, they want to wallow in self-pity. I know a woman whose husband was not worrying her. She went as far as um, faking pregnancy just to prove a point. Yes, her husband doesn't know this till tomorrow. But her husband wasn't even stressing her. Nobody was stressing her. She was just wallowing in self-pity. And when I talk to you, when I'm like, if you don't, um, Take care of yourself. You don't love yourself. Nobody's going to love yourself for you. Mm. So I think the major challenge women who are waiting have is that they wallow in self-pity. They actually want people to pity them. But I told myself, as a child of God, a child of God is not supposed to throw pity parties. At all. And I made up my mind not to throw pity parties. And it worked for me. Then along the line, I found a business that used to keep me really excited. I began to read books. I didn't used to read before them, but when I came across that business, multi-level marketing, I began to read books on self-esteem, on so many things that changed my mindset. And I think that, that was in 2005 or so. Mm. And then that was six years into the marriage. So with that exposure, I now knew that there wasn't any way I was going to let anybody bring me down. And I knew that I wasn't going to make myself sad not that there were moments I was sad, I will tell you. Let me tell you one typical time I used to be sad. Each time I was traveling, because I've always been trading, so I used to travel a lot then. So each time I was traveling, I get to the airport, and I see a husband and a wife yeah, with children family. carrying their small, small boxes. That was the time. That was the only time or most regular time I used to feel like, oh, I wish I could just have my kids. And when I shared it with one of my very close friends who was also waiting, she said, Akoma, do you know what I'm waiting for? The only thing I'm waiting for is one will travel with these children you know, and they will carry their small, small boxes. I say, wow, the same thing I'm waiting for. So I think that was one time, each time I got to the airport and I saw families traveling, I'm like, oh, when is it going to happen? That one I can tell you clearly, those are the situations and when I see families, I'm like, oh God, let this thing happen, let mm. this thing happen, you know. Sometime uh, in our church in Port Harcourt, a couple who waited for 12 years, they were elderly then already, they invited my husband and I to their house for a weekend, to their home, for a weekend, a big home. And we went, and my husband and I, we were wondering, what do they want to talk about? Why are they inviting us to their home? So we went for a weekend. It was a Friday night that we got to their house. They didn't even say anything to us until Sunday after church, we went back to their house. So over lunch, they were now telling us um, that they want to tell us that, they are, that we are privileged. 
My husband looked at me, he was, you know, touching me on that dining table. He said, I'm privileged, yes, for God to choose you to want to showcase his power. That's what he told us. He said, when you said the scripture, you hear of Sarah, you hear of Hannah. He said, why do we talk about them? Because something is special about, is special them. about them. So when you experience delays, that means God knows you and chooses you out to glorify himself. I've never heard that, you know. I was hearing that from that angle for the first time. Mm. My husband was pinching me, we laughed afterwards, but later I found out that they were actually making sense. They were because you wouldn't sense. actually be seated here today yeah. if you didn't have, you know, that experience yeah. to share. Yeah, they were actually making sense. So, and I remember one of my friends too, who was waiting at the time, when they talk about Sarah, she said, come on, please don't even go there, don't talk about Sarah. That's one story I don't want to hear in the Bible. She said, please, I don't want to wait for 20 something years and all that. I said, look, God knows what is good for us. The scripture says in Habakkuk, it says, the vision is for an appointed time. Though it tarries, wait for it, it must surely come to pass. Those were one of the scriptures I held on to. I said, it's for an appointed time. And that is why I'm here today. If my four children, if I had four children and they just came four years, I wouldn't be here today mm. encouraging somebody out there. Mm. So True. when you look back, you see that some of these challenges is actually for a purpose, so that it can be a, a comfort to someone out there. And that's exactly what we're doing today. Then one more thing I did was that I made sure I was making money. <laughs> I love making money, yes. I made sure I was making money. Making money is good. I love money too. Yes. I love to make money. I made money. sure I was making yes. money. Yes. Yeah. If, if you don't have money to travel and your children are dragging boxes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I made sure I was busy. Mm. I was busy making money. I was, I was actually doing a lot of traveling then. So my friend and I, so we were busy. And for me, that was so much fun, traveling, seeing the world and all that. So it also helped me traveling, mm. helped me and all that. I think that's about that aspect. Then you want to talk about... Um, let me say something about um, one regret I have. One regret I have, and when I see people who are younger, who are waiting, I tell them, please follow your passion. Hmm. Do what you have to do. Yes, I was doing business, but I could have done better. I could have put structures in place. You know, because now maybe you're going for one IVF for the next three months, you're not active, you're not doing something. So the business depended solely on me. So you know what I'm saying? But if I had a structure in place, like I've always tell my friends by now, I would have been a big a millionaire. A, a multi-billionaire. Yes, because I would have, you know, when I look back, I've done business for 20 years, but you find out the, the first 12 years or 11 years, mm. you're like you, waiting you to distracted. get pregnant. I was distracted. But I tell people, look, the baby is going to come. You're not the one going to make the baby come. That's the truth. Yes, you have to go to the clinic. You have to maybe take medications, pray and all that. But it's God that will eventually... You know, but most of the time, happen. yes, we, we, we like acting God. So one thing I regret, like I tell people, please don't make that mistake. Follow your passion. Do business. If you want to work, pick up a job. Put Pursue your career. Pursue your, career, Give pursue your, your dreams. Give it your time. all at that time. Because I'm telling you, because when the kids come, you may not even have all that time anymore. But if you already have a structure, have a system that is running, then the money will just be coming in. That's the truth. So I think that's one regret I have. Not putting so a structure. So when the babies came, you, you saw the struggle. Yes, I even now had to slow down again, again yeah. for a few more years, you know, and all that. Because then I would wonder, I'm like, if I leave this baby, people will say, what's she looking for? Now mm. baby has come, you know? Mm. So I was careful. You know, our society is always sure. judging. <laughs> yeah. The baby is there, problem. The baby <laughs> is not there, problem. Honestly, honestly. So I will say that um, 12 years, it was a long wait, but. I found a way to cope with it. I would share an experience. There was a lady who came to my house once with a family friend, and we were talking about children, children saying some things. And when they left, she called me back. Maybe when they left, they discussed. Maybe her friend told her that, oh, she doesn't have a child or something. And she had the boldness to call me on the phone to tell me sorry that she was talking about kids. And I don't remember my response to her, but my response that I gave her, she could not even drop the phone. That's mm. what I'm talking about. So you need to, you need to your self-esteem don't let people validate you. Mm. Do you get? The kids were not there, but I didn't feel anything was missing. I don't know how to say it. Yes, I knew something was missing, but I didn't live like something was missing. Because it's nobody's define business. You yes. at that time. I didn't let it define me. And my friends couldn't understand it. People around me couldn't understand it. But it worked for me. Because what happens at times, people want to act God. Why do you want to act God? I don't want to act God. I do my part, then I leave the rest for God to do. 
And God showed up for me, actually, when I least expected it. God showed up. Mm. Yes, God showed up when I least expected it. And um, she's going to be 10. So I asked, yeah. um, when you conceived eventually, did, huh? were you hiding it? Were you... Oh. <laughs> Because, you know, village people, so to speak, are the ones that had, had, you know, done whatever to stop the baby from coming. That's, you know, one of the general beliefs in our society. So how did you handle yours? When I conceived, when I did that pregnancy test and it was positive, I couldn't call my husband to tell him because he was on board the plane. Oh. And um, it was my mom I called. I was so excited. I began to weep. Yes, I think... That was the second time I was experiencing that strong emotion. Yes. And I began to weep. And I was telling my mom, my mom was a nurse then, she's late now. And as I told her, I said, Mommy, mommy, they say I'm pregnant, they say I'm pregnant. She said, Take it easy, take it easy, cool down, calm down, calm down. This was how many years down the line? This was the 13th year. Yeah, the 13th year. The pregnancy that stayed. Yes, that brought the baby girl. Yes. So my husband was above the plane, so I couldn't share the exciting news with him that the pregnancy test was positive. So I had to call my mom. And she said, yes, yes. Yeah. She didn't, she, you know, as an experienced medical person, she didn't show the kind of excitement I showed. She just said, that's OK. Just calm down. Just calm down. <laughs> just calm down. She was scared. She was scared because I was crying too already. Much, too much emotion. Yes, yeah. I was crying. And you know, I'm not a very secretive person. You know, in this journey of life, when you have challenges, the people you surround yourself with is important. I will say that the few people I call my friends are my friends indeed. They were always, none of them ever, my very close friends, they never looked down on me. So when I, was, when I, when I got pregnant, everybody knew. Mm. I'm not a secretive person. Mm. Everybody knew. Um, so one of them always told me, whenever she sees me, she said, babe, God is not a small boy now. He knows you need to have children. So, <laughs> She's always telling me that. She'd say, she say, oh, girl, God is not a boy now. I know. He knows that you have children. So we believe the kids are coming. Yeah. She used to always tell So I had very close friends. So I didn't hide it from them. Mm. So the moment they knew I was pregnant, um, I didn't go announcing to everybody. Mm. But I think in a few months time, everybody just knew around me. Mm. I didn't call on the phone, actually, to tell anybody anyway. I was pregnant. Mm. But if you see me, I come out, you're looking so hard. I say, it don't happen. You know, that kind of thing. So. That was it. I didn't believe, you know, spiritual things. I had some very funny dreams. Hmm. Then, many years ago, when I had such dreams, the pregnancy, me came down. I still had those dreams now. But um, I think it was just the right time. Pregnancy didn't come down. God showed up for me. Hmm. Somebody was praying for me. And uh, so much prayers. And God, I want to say God just saw me through. Hmm. And I became victorious. Hmm. And, um, and that's why I can encourage somebody out there. Please don't let your challenges define you. Don't let anybody define you. Don't wait for people's validation. Don't be sad because people think, don't be sad because people think you need to be sad. No. <laughs> Worry is like a rocking chair. I'm telling you. You just keep going, but it's not moving you it's from not, exactly. A to B. It's not moving you. You're just where you are, <laughs> all alone. Yes. So. Ladies and guys out there, don't let anybody define you. Don't let anybody validate you. I want to say to everybody and out there. And for the partners, too. And it's for the important partners, for the yeah. partners to support each other. Please, my husband, you know, by the 10th year, I had a third IVF. And then I was like, oh, I'm getting tired. My husband said, my wife, please don't get tired. Is that the 10th or 11th year? He said, my wife, don't get tired. Let's just keep doing what we have to do. And I was like, then if this man is not tired of me, then I just have to do what I have to do. Mm. And I remember then one of my friends will call me, my very close friend. She will call me, she will say, Akoma, we're very close. Mm. She'll say, Akoma, our husbands are not sending us away. <laughs> Since they've decided not to send us away, we just have to have this baby. Somehow. Somehow. And God has to answer, yeah. he has to show. Yeah, she'll always call me, she'll say, Akoma, see your husband though, he's such a nice guy, see my husband. They are not even doing as if something is missing in the home. So that means we'll just have to have these children. We used to encourage each other. Mm. And so when you feel like giving up, when I feel like I'm giving up, I don't yeah. want to go to the so clinic find, again. So find a good support. Yes, find a good support. Yes, find a good support, honestly. Find a good support. 
Um, but I, I, like I've said something about self-esteem, self-esteem is important because I've discovered that some women, because of low self-esteem, when you pass, you feel somebody's talking about, about you. you. Yeah. Why don't you think they're admiring your clothes? Each time I passed and people talked about me, I believe they were either admiring my dress or my shoe or, you know, something about me, honestly. And I, I will tell you, once I was traveling, I stopped uh, my in-laws place here in Lagos and another distant in-law was there. Mm. And she was touching my tummy. And she was saying, ah, your tummy is flat, something. Why is your tummy still flat? Um, it was six years. How did you deal with that? I didn't realize she was talking about pregnancy. It just, I just realized like six years later that, oh, that's what that woman was talking about on that day. Honestly, when I say it, people think I'm crazy, but I'm telling you the truth. Because you, you, you kind of switched off. Yes. Switched I, I, people's reactions yes, yes. and perceptions yes. of you. So oh. I, I didn't think... Well, six years down the line, I realized that, oh, that's what she was talking about on that day. I didn't realize that she was talking about. Honestly, I was responding like, oh, I either lost weight or added weight. Mm. Maybe that's why my tummy isn't that mm. big or small. Mm. Honestly, so that's what I'm talking about. Don't let people define you. Because you need to be alive. You need to be emotionally stable to have the baby. That's the truth. And what happens is when these children eventually come, you will not be asking yourself, why are you worried so much? Why are you worried so much? You know, so I decided to trust God, and God did not disappoint me. Oh. Bottom line, yes, God did Amazing. not disappoint me. Yes, Amazing. and um, I give it to my husband. He's a fantastic man. I think he made the whole journey easy. He made it easy. And your in-laws too, and because my in-laws. the story for a lot of yes. other women is different. Yes, the pressure demands so yes. much that. In fact, you know, there was he a also time begins I... to question things, yeah, yeah. and then want to. Yeah, my father-in-law used to le read a lot. I remember I saw one of the books he was reading on faith as we went to the village and the paper fell out from that book. And I saw that there was a particular line in that book that he underlined. There was a scripture in the Bible in that book. And he wrote on that paper, he said, Lord, please bless my son and my daughter, Akoma, with children. Mm. And I'm like, wow. So at times the in-laws are actually the problem. Instead at times, of praying with yeah, you. Yeah, of praying with you. They put you under so much pressure. Mm. Each time we visited, they prayed for us with all their heart. And daddy would tell me, I remember when he was in his 70s, he would say, Ada, I'm 75 or 70 what? I must carry your baby. Mm. He used to always tell me that. I said, don't worry, I'm going to carry your baby. So I think that encouragement from the in-laws is also important. So, so important. The irony is at times that you find out, at times it's even your physical mom. That they worries will be putting you, that you so under pressure. pressure. That's why I said yes. both family yes, and in-laws. Yes, yes, they put you under so much pressure. I thank God my mom didn't put me under any such pressure because she's a believer. And she's also a medical person. Yes, and she's also Maybe. a medical person. Yes, yes, yes she will understand. always encourage you. Have you done this? Go to the clinic, do this, follow instructions. <laughs> And but let prayed, me go a bit yeah. personal. Um, during all those years, what, what, what was the medical record? What, what did they say was the issue? Um, initially, initially, what was the problem? Was there any problem initially? Okay, initially, I was okay. Mm -hmm. It's just that um, when I did a, a, a scan, when I had that miscarriage, mm -hmm. okay, it was a miscarriage now, that first miscarriage I had mm -hmm. in my fourth, after four months of marriage, marriage yeah. that took me to the hospital. And we began to do some tests. And um, then I discovered my uterus was very small. And they asked me if I've ever had a surgery. I said, no, I never had a surgery. And the guy drew on the paper what a normal uterus should look like mm. and what mine looked like. And I'm like, I didn't put the uterus there. <laughs>